Welcome back to my channel. My name is Jamie Lee and I am a mixed media artist and on my channel I do art, time-lapse videos, tutorials, and I talk about mixed media art and art stuff. Just anything I find interesting that relates to art. For today's video I thought I would go back to doing something a little off the beaten path. I did a video about the Mandela effect in art. I am super interested in anything related to the paranormal, history, interesting history, uh, conspiracy theories, anything that's kind of just interesting and different. Uh, I love researching it, I love finding out about it, and I thought it would be fun to do a video talking about some art conspiracy theories. Before we talk about the conspiracy theories that I found, I would like to just jump in at the beginning and give a little bit of a disclaimer and a definition of what a conspiracy theory actually is. I'm not an expert, uh, I'm not even really considering myself a conspiracy theorist, I just am into art and interesting stuff and I love to find out information and I thought it would be fun to put it all into a video. This is just research that I have done mostly on the internet. I've tried to get my information from the most reputable sources that I could find so that I am giving information that is backed up by either experts or people who know what's going on or have done research. The definition that I found for conspiracy theory is, and I'm going to read this, so if I look down that's why, a theory that explains an event or a set of circumstances as the result of a secret plot usually by powerful conspirators. And I have three conspiracy theories for this video because they are a little detailed and there's a lot of information that goes into talking about these so this is going to be um, a long enough video with actually just the three and I did come across more in my research so if you're interested in more I would be happy to do another video after this one so if you watch this and you like it and you let me know in the comments that it's something that you're into and you'd like to see another one, I would definitely be open to doing more than one of these videos. So let's get into the conspiracies. The first art conspiracy theory that I came across is in regards to Spanish painter Francisco Goya. Goya was very famous. He was considered to be on par with Picasso and Miro. Um, he was a royal painter and I have some notes over here so if you see me looking that way I'm just checking my notes. He was the official royal painter of Charles IV and Ferdinand VII and so he was not just some you know hobbyist painter he had a lot of recognition a lot of respect as an artist and the conspiracy theory surrounding francisco goya is in regards to probably some of his most well recognized or most famous paintings they're called the black paintings it is a series of 14 murals that were painted on the walls of his home his home was named Quinto del Sordo. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, I'm going to butcher some names just to warn you up ahead of time. The story originally went that Goya bought a small cottage in the countryside and he resided there for several years. So the records show that he bought this home in 1819 and the paperwork from the property at that time showed that he lived there from about 1819 to 1824, which is when he signed the house over to his grandson Mariano. And that happened in 1823, and then Goya left the house in 1824. He moved to France, where he stayed until he died there in 1828. So he was only in the house a short time and it is said that somewhere between 1820 and 1823 was when he painted these 14 murals. Uh, there actually are said to be 15 total but one is lost. So he spent the time in the house painting these murals and then um, 
the murals do still exist. Eventually, um, since they were painted on the walls of a home and he was a very famous artist, they had the paintings removed from the walls and installed in the Museo del Prado, where they are still on display in regular rotation today. So you can go see the black paintings. So that all sounds pretty legit, right? What's the deal with a conspiracy theory in regards to these paintings? Well, the thought is that Goya never painted these. They are actually fakes. And the reasoning behind this is as follows. So a book publishing company, Scala Publishers, commissioned a book specifically on the black paintings of Francisco Goya. And in order to get this book written, they went to a art history professor and expert researcher. His name is Juan Jose Juncara. And Juan Jose Juncara is well known for diving deep into research using the Spanish archives. This publishing house called on him to research the black paintings to get the best information possible and then they were going to publish a book about the paintings. So Goya dove into the archives and did his thing and what he came up with was something nobody was expecting. He went back to the property records for the house that Goya purchased in 1819 and according to everybody who saw the murals um, or knew about the murals, they were located on the first and second floor of this house. When the house was purchased by Goya, there was no second story to the house. The property records only show it was a one-story house. So it'd be a little difficult for Goya to paint murals on the walls of the second story of a house if the second story did not exist. So that was the first problem he ran into. The second problem that he ran into was that um, a lot of the information about Goya and what went on during that time was pretty fuzzy. Um, most people attributed the time that it took him to paint the murals from about 1820 to about 1823, and Juan Jose, Juan Jose Juncara wanted like exact information. He was starting to become a little bit suspicious of what he was finding when he didn't find any mention of these murals from contemporaries of Goya at the time. Um, people who visited the house didn't leave the house saying, oh my god, did you see these 14 creepy ass murals in this house? Like nobody was talking about it. And the reason why I put it that way is because the murals were disturbing. They were really a departure from his usual paintings. He actually did a lot of fairly happy paintings throughout his life, um, bright, colorful, and these were none of that. These were dark, disturbing, weird, creepy murals. Uh, the one that's most recognized, and uh, disclaimer, it is a little bit disturbing, so if you don't want to look at it, um, just kind of skip ahead, is going to be this guy right here which is called um, Saturn Devouring One of His Sons. But that was probably one of the most recognized of the murals. Um, and as you can obviously see, super creepy and really disturbing. And a real departure from his usual style of painting, which is kind of odd if you think about it. He spent his whole life painting a certain way and then all of a sudden these 14 murals are completely different and then he goes to France and then he passes away. Um, what people had said in the past was that when he moved into this house he was either extremely fearful of going crazy or that he actually was going crazy which is why these murals would make sense. He was descending into madness, basically, and he painted these murals as that was going on. 
Another point of contention for him when he was doing his research was that people at the time were not talking about these murals. They obviously, if anybody had seen them, would start talking about them because one of the country's most famous artists was suddenly painting these dark and incredibly disturbing murals and nobody really mentioned it. So um, he talked about the fact that he found some documentation for like inventory um, to go along with what was in the house at the time and that the wording used in this inventory did not match up with the correct wording that was being used at the time. Um, it was basically like saying that somebody was using slang at a time when that slang had not even been invented. So um, if somebody in 1940 was saying, groovy man, peace out, you'd be like, well, that doesn't make any sense because nobody talked that way then. This is kind of that same scenario. So what he found was that um, only two people in the documented stuff he could find actually mentioned the paintings and one of the people actually wrote about these paintings many years after the fact. So really only one person who was around at the time that these paintings were supposedly created actually mentioned them. So a friend of Goya supposedly did an inventory and he supposedly described the paintings and described the interior of the house. And Hunkera came to the conclusion that this inventory could not have been done at the time that it was said to be done um, because the wording was kind of impossible. They were using basically slang that wasn't in existence at that time. He found in the documentation that a word used for writing desk, which was in Goya's home, was the word, I'm probably going to butcher this, Vargueno. And he says that that word did not exist at that time. People would have referred to a desk as Populera or Escritorio. So he's saying that people are using words to describe this so-called inventory of the inside of this house that they would never have used. Juan Jose Juncara came to the conclusion as he was doing this research to write this book for this publishing company that the paintings he was being asked to research were fakes. He believed fully that the information that was presented to him through all of his research showed that Goya was not the person who painted the paintings. So that leads to the question, okay, well, who the heck painted them? He believes that it was actually Goya's son, Javier, who painted the paintings. And this timeline matches up because Javier um, actually did have painting uh, skills. He was a businessman, he was not a painter, but he did paint. And he would have had access to the house after Goya left and he would have been able to paint the murals. And what Hungara believes happened is that Javier painted these paintings on the wall and then the grandson of Goya, Javier's son Mariano, was tasked with selling the house and he figured he would get more money selling the house if he attributed the murals in the house to Goya because Goya was a famous painter and so he would be able to use that as leverage for selling this house for more money. If you're thinking of things in terms of what people have done for money, then I mean, that explanation does make sense. A lot of people do dispute this conclusion that Hungara came up with. Um, they do not believe that he is correct. They think that, um, you know, the property records could be explained away. Um, a lot of times houses have add-ons or different things that are not always included in the updates until, you know, a little bit of time has gone by. So it's entirely possible the house had a second story added and it was just not listed in the paperwork at that time. People believe that Goya definitely still is the person that made these murals and that the evidence that Hungara is 
basically piecing together is just to bolster his own story or what he found. And he did in fact go ahead and write the book on the 14 paintings. And um, what I found to be odd was that he didn't actually write the book and say definitively, hey, I believe that these paintings are fakes. I don't think he actually painted them. He kind of like hid the conclusion he made in the book, but did it in a way that really people who are reading it wouldn't go, you know, close the book and go, oh my god, you know, that was definitely a conspiracy, you know, they tried to cover up the fact that Goya was not the actual person that painted these and everybody believed he did and on and on. So it seems like if he really believed this, then he should have gone to the publishers and said, hey, I did the research he asked me to and I found out something that we weren't expecting, but now I'm going to write the book according to what I found. He didn't really do that, so that's a little odd to me. That is the story of Goya and the black paintings. A lot of the information that I found um, that I relied on the most for accurate information came from a New York Times article and it was called The Secret of the Black Paintings. Our next art conspiracy theory has to do with Leonardo da Vinci and you could probably do a whole series of conspiracy theories surrounding da Vinci and all of his works and everything, but this centers on one particular painting called the Salvador Mundi. The Salvador Mundi is a painting that Leonardo da Vinci, I almost said Leonardo DiCaprio, what the heck? Leonardo da Vinci, um, it's attributed to him and originally they thought that he painted this painting and then there was a copy made and the original was lost and then in later years they have discovered through restoration that they think this painting the salvador Mundi, that they have is actually leonardo da vinci's painting he actually painted it um throughout the years it's been attributed to like a school of other artists who were trained by da Vinci and one of them did it and then suddenly it was moved up to well a student of da Vinci did it and then finally they attribute it to da Vinci himself and said that he actually painted this and that's actually not the conspiracy in regards to this painting the Salvador Mundi is currently uh, quote unquote missing although most people in the know in the art world pretty much know exactly where it is. Most people believe it's being kept in a secure art storage facility in Switzerland. So how did this painting that was supposedly da Vinci's but not da Vinci's end up in a storage facility instead of on display? Um, and this is actually a really like relevant question for right now because the Louvre in Paris actually asked the owner of the painting if they could borrow it so they could put it on display because they have a big Leonardo da Vinci show happening in just a few days. It's October 15th, 2019 and they're planning to have this show and they asked the owner of the painting if they could put the Salvador Mundi on display and they did not get a reply and the Louvre is having to scramble now and uh, basically say we tried to get it and we couldn't and that painting will not be a part of this exhibit which I feel like would make the Louvre feel kind of embarrassed you know they're having this whole big deal about da Vinci and they can't even get this painting which everybody knows it's out there and most people actually do know where it's located but the person who has it just doesn't want it shown. And this also happened in the Louvre located in Abu Dhabi. So there is a, a Louvre museum in Abu Dhabi and it was inaugurated in 2017. And at the time that they were basically getting together, you know, all of the people that were going to come to this big opening for this art museum they wanted to have the Salvador Mundi on display there 
and it was a no-show there as well. So basically this is the painting that just doesn't show up for stuff it's invited to. Um, which, I mean, I can't say I blame it. So the reason why the painting is now where it's at, that is also part of this whole uh, big conspiracy theory around this painting. The Salvador Monday painting has changed hands numerous times, obviously throughout its basically 500 year history. That's a lot of years for a painting to be floating here, there, and everywhere. Um, the most recent purchase of this painting was in 2017 and it was sold at Christie's. It became the most expensive piece of art ever sold. The painting itself sold for $450.3 million at that auction. That's a lot of money for a painting that has disappeared. So who bought it and how did it get to Christie's to be sold for that much money? The timeline, and I'm looking here at my notes, uh, just if you see me looking down, it was believed to be painted in 1500. They thought maybe da Vinci painted the painting for King Louis of France. The painting remained kind of around uh, until 1763 and it was in the royal family's possession and then suddenly 1763 comes around and the painting goes missing. And it goes missing for 150 years. In the late 19th century, suddenly the painting is back and it goes into the collection of Sir Frederick Cook, who was a man who lived in Virginia. In 1958, it comes around again um, at Sotheby's in London, there was an auction in June of 1958, and it sold for 45 pounds. It would be about 57 uh, dollars, so not very valuable at this point because, again, they didn't think this was actually a Leonardo da Vinci painting. They thought this was a copy of a painting that da Vinci had done 500 years ago, basically. So nobody really paid attention to the painting again until 2005 when it turned up at an estate sale in America and an art dealer purchased it for $10,000. In 2013 was when stuff started ramping up and then a bunch of dealers got together and sold the painting at Sotheby's again for about 75 to 80 million. And then the person who actually bought the painting for that price literally turned around and sold it to another person and jacked the price up by about half and sold it to a Russian billionaire whose name is Dmitry Rybolovlev. Rybolovlev. Dmitry Rybolovlev. He bought the painting for $127.5 million and he ended up being actually quite angry because he found out that the person that sold it to him, a man named Yves Bouvier, uh, deliberately jacked up the price to sell it to him and he wasn't very happy about that. Um, in 2017, he put the painting up for sale at Christie's auction and it was bought for $450.3 million. Now, who would have the money? to pay $450 million for this painting. So as it turns out, the person that bought the painting was Saudi Prince Bader bin Abdullah bin Mohammed bin Farhan al Saud, an ally of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So the painting was purchased, obviously, by a Saudi and which makes it kind of weird that the Abu Dhabi Louvre wanted to display the painting and was not able to do it. So when the painting was purchased, it was supposed to be debuted at the Louvre Abu Dhabi in September of 2018, but it never, it never was and it's been kind of missing ever since. Um, although it's not really considered missing. So there's a lot of controversy and kind of conspiracy surrounding this painting. Like why is it being hidden? Why is it suddenly the most expensive painting in the world? But people weren't even agreeing, you know, 
just a couple decades ago whether this was an actual Leonardo da Vinci painting or whether it was a copy. Basically when the painting was rediscovered in 2005 and restored in 2007, the restoration was what caused people to think, oh, this is not a copy, this is an actual da Vinci. And the style and the way the painting was done and the materials used all correlated with da Vinci paintings. And so at the auction where the billionaire Russian businessman Dmitry Rybolovlev uh, was trying to sell this painting, the price went up to $450 million because there was basically a bidding war over the phone between two anonymous bidders and then finally it was revealed that the person who purchased the painting was actually Prince Bader. And then the Louvre in Abu Dhabi even announced that they would be showing the Salvador Monday and then they would basically have to do what the Louvre is doing right now and saying, psych, sorry, we're not actually going to show it. We thought we were. And then, of course, let's not even get into the whole Middle Eastern Russian ties with political uh, leanings and all that kind of stuff because... A lot of the articles kind of point to different connections that are supposedly made and that might be also part of the whole conspiracy here. I'm just not even going to get into any of that stuff. And then a lot of people are actually saying that the reason why the painting isn't able to be shown is because the restoration caused issues with the painting and it actually heavily damaged it. And people are trying to figure out how to save the painting uh, from any further damage. Most people in the know aren't really upset that the painting is missing because they realize that it's being kept somewhere safe. Uh, it is in the hands of a private owner, even though he is a member of the royal family. Uh, he did purchase the painting, and so it is, you know, his to do whatever he sees fit with. Uh, if he wants to take it on a yacht and go out in the ocean with it, he can. It's his painting, and he paid a lot of money for it. Many people say he overpaid for it. So that is the story of the Salvador Mundi, Leonardo da Vinci's copied painting that is now considered an original painting that is now also whereabouts unknown. Oh, and let's take a puppy break. In case you needed to have a little cuteness. Oh, bright. <laughs> she thinks it's bright. Uh, I showed you my newest member of the family last time in my video. This is Stella who wants to eat my necklace. Uh, she's teething and she has tiny razor sharp teeth that will bite a finger off if you let it. <laughs> so, Stella. Because, you know, art conspiracy videos need a cute puppy in them. <laughs> and just to mention about the Salvador Monday information, there is a bunch of information on the internet right now, um, especially since the Louvre was supposed to have the painting for their upcoming show. Uh, like I said, October of 2019 is when this video is being filmed, and that show is supposed to happen it's October 24th, 2019, which is about a week away from now. At this point, they still... Basically, they were releasing statements saying, hey, guess what? We're not going to have the Monday painting. Sorry, we thought we were. Um, they tried to gather together as much of da Vinci's work as they possibly could, and so this painting missing from it, um, I'm sure, is kind of disappointing. Basically, got all my information from... Um, there was the auction websites where the actual sales happened, and there were news articles about the different... Um, sellings of the painting because it was so heavily followed because it is considered the most expensive painting ever sold. So there is a lot of information on the internet. I tried to steer clear of just, you know, general information sites and I tried to target art, uh, news information sites, the auction websites and that kind of thing. So that's where I got my information for that um, part of this video. We are going to go on to conspiracy theory number three. This last conspiracy theory has to do with Jack the Ripper. 
uh, which this whole conspiracy theory, I find it in one way to be super fascinating and interesting because uh, if you don't know, and again, if you hear noises, my puppy is chewing on the rug. Uh, probably should stop her from doing that. Hang on. No, no, no. Chew on your rope. There you go. Good girl. Okay, she's no longer chewing on the rug. Thank goodness. Uh, I did not realize that. <laughs> I thought she was chewing on a rope. Anyway, so any noises, dogs. The... The reason why I find this so fascinating is, of course, Jack the Ripper is one of the most famous serial killers in history, and the reason why the case is so famous, aside from the fact that um, he was considered to be the first known serial killer, is that there's so much wondering still about who this person could have been because as we know it's never been solved definitively um there's a bunch of theories there's a bunch of information there's all kinds of different avenues that people have gone down and documentation that they say proves that this person did it and this person did it but really nobody actually knows nobody knows who jack the ripper was and there is actually a theory about Jack the Ripper that ties into art. And the the reason why I find this fascinating and funny is that Patricia Cornwell has a theory about Jack the Ripper. So even though I used to be a huge fan of Patricia Cornwell, I kind of stopped reading her books. I haven't read them in years, but at the time I was reading them, gosh, I loved them so much. They were great books. She believes a British artist named Walter Sickert is actually the Jack the Ripper killer and she has spent six million dollars of her own money trying to prove this theory. She wrote two books about it and basically her her thoughts on this have made her kind of a laughing stop to some experts because a lot of what she found people say she's just trying to take research and information that she found and fit it into her theory so that it works instead of taking research and information and using it to form a theory um she's basically doing things backwards so there have been people that have said you know it's the laughing stock there's no way that this guy did it she's just you know trying to fit the pieces of the puzzle in a way that doesn't work but she's trying to make them fit and so that's why I kind of find it funny too because I mean especially if you're a person that's passionate about doing something and you find something that you really truly believe in and then you spend your time and energy and money and heck a lot of money and she wrote two books so that's time um, and she truly believes this and then you know people basically ridicule her for her findings but on the other hand, if she really did not research things correctly and is just trying to make her findings fit her theory, then that's obviously bad research. At this point, there's so much information out there and we probably will never actually know who the real Jack the Ripper killer is. It's not like we can bring him back to life and say, hey man, did you do this or no? So let's get into why this painter, a British painter named Walter Sickert, is thought to be the Jack the Ripper killer by Patricia Cornwell. Um, he was a British painter. People who knew him during his life described him as colorful, charming, fascinating. So he just really was, he drew people to him. They found him to be an interesting sort of guy. So how does that you know, correlate to him being a serial killer. Also, to be fair to Patricia, she wasn't actually the first person to come up with the idea that Walter Sickert was possibly Jack the Ripper. It all started in the 1970s when the royal conspiracy theory was developed. And basically, this theory was people who were trying to figure out who Jack the Ripper was, and they thought that the killer could possibly be a member of the royal family. When this theory first came about, the theory then was that he was actually forced into helping with these murders by a member of the royal family. Then a person named Jean Overton Fuller wrote a book called Sickert and the Ripper Crimes. She said that evidence was given to her mother 
by a person who was a colleague of Sigurd's. And then that person had confided in Fuller's mother and told her that she had kept the secret that Sigurd was the true identity of Jack the Ripper and that there were clues in Sigurd's artwork that supported the idea that he was Jack the Ripper. Now, Sickert was a painter. This is one of the main reasons why Sickert is actually linked to the Jack the Ripper killings in such a way that, you know, some people discount it, but a lot of people don't because his artwork was extremely disturbing. And he dealt in very ghoulish themes in his artwork. And in fact, he himself was known to be kind of obsessed with Jack the Ripper. So Sickert actually painted a painting in the early 1900s that was titled Jack the Ripper's Bedroom. And the reason he painted this was because his landlady had told him that the Ripper was the previous tenant of the room that he was staying in when he had moved to Camden Town. And so he painted this painting. It's a a dark painting that kind of shows you looking in the door and you're looking into a room and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on honestly um then in september of 1907 a woman was found mutilated in her bed in camden and her murder was known as the camden town murder and sigurd being the guy that he was made a lot of paintings and drawings related to this murder so, um, it was pretty controversial and it also kind of gave him um, some clout as a painter because he was actually quite a good painter. So, disturbing but good. Obviously then, the theory that Sickert was Jack the Ripper was further brought to the public attention by Patricia Cornwell. She published her book Portrait of a Killer in 2002 and she actually looked for clues in his paintings. She did psychological and personality studies of him and showed that he had the traits of basically a serial killer. My puppy is attacking her bed right now. She had forensic experts analyze the DNA from the Ripper letters. She, um, I mean, she went all out and this is why it cost so much money for her to research this because she called on people to basically take a look at all the evidence and see what they could find. Still in 2017, she's still convinced that Sickert is basically either Jack the Ripper or involved in the murders. The painting that Sickert made called Jack the Ripper's Bedroom. It hangs in England's Manchester Art Gallery and Sickert was uh, founder of the Camden Town Group which is a group of post-impressionist artists. He was considered to be an important influence on art, avant-garde art, and he really had made a name for himself in Victorian London so people knew him. Like I said, anybody who was asked described him as fascinating and charismatic. He was eccentric, but people considered him to be really cutting edge as an artist and uh, his work was often very ghoulish. He lived in London in 1882. He really wanted to paint the unglamorous everyday life of the dark corners of London and he painted London's working class through the 1890s. During the time of the Jack the Ripper murders, Sickert was 28 years old. He was a little under six feet tall. He had light brown hair, a light complexion, a mustache, and his physical description was pretty close to what um, descriptions had been given about Jack the Ripper. But really, at that time, nobody was putting together Sickert with Jack the Ripper. They just, that connection hadn't been made at that time. And really the first time anybody had mentioned him in regards to it was decades after his death. Like I said, the royal conspiracy theory in the 70s was the first time somebody had put together his name with possibly being Jack the Ripper or involved with Jack the Ripper. So to this day, there is, like I said, there is some evidence that, you know, obviously he was kind of a disturbed guy. Um, he had a fascination with Jack the Ripper, 
Uh, but just because you're fascinated with somebody, even if it is a serial killer or a dark person or a dark event, doesn't mean that you're involved in it or that, you know, you had anything to do with it. It just means that it catches your fascination and you're interested in it. He did paint uh, paintings of murder scenes, which that's a little disturbing, but, you know, people have painted crazy stuff and it doesn't mean they went and killed a bunch of people but the evidence shows that there are a whole host of people who could have been Jack the Ripper um, not just Sickert so even though it's a theory and even though Patricia Cornwell strongly believes that he is Jack the Ripper we'll probably never know it may be one of those things that, you know, it's just never going to be solved. So that is the third art conspiracy theory that I came up with. I do have more that I looked into. Um, like I said, this video is a little bit longer because I went into depth with each of these. So if you're interested in hearing more art conspiracy theories, then just leave me a comment below, give this video a like, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope it gave you something to think about or was at least entertaining. It was entertaining for me to make it just because I find all this stuff extremely fascinating and interesting. And so I hope you liked watching it and give me a thumbs up if you did. Subscribe to my channel. I do more traditional art videos, but I also have done one video that's along the same line of this one and I would like to do more in fact since this is October and we are coming up on Halloween I have the idea to do a video on haunted paintings um, I know I have one in particular that I've looked into and I might do a video on just that one or if there's more I might combine a couple of them and do a video like this one where I talk about a couple different things like that so if that's something you're interested stick around I'll be doing that video before Halloween so thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day and from me and Stella bye ah, look at that little tummy so cute bye